Here we go. All right, so welcome everyone. This is the quick seminar now, now going online. And our speaker today is Steve Flamia, now at the AWS Center for Quantum Computing. Steve has done a lot of work on a variety of topics in quantum information theory, um, including some work on tomography, er quantum error correction, Hamiltonian complexity, and many other topics. Um, so today he's going to talk about characterizing free Fermi on solvable spin models by a graph theory. Thanks very much. Take it away, Steve. Yeah, thanks, Ikai, and thanks very much for the invitation. Um, I don't even have to travel uh, to go, so it was an <laughs> I accepted actually before all this coronavirus nonsense, uh, and I would have been happy to visit, but um, um, it's even easier when I just have to open my open Zoom. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about some joint work today with Adrian Chapman, who was my postdoc at Sydney. Um, this work uh, you can find on the archive uh, over here. Uh, it's going to be published uh, very shortly in Quantum. Uh, and I want to credit Adrian for making the first draft of these slides. Uh, I did make some edits though, so if there are any mistakes in these slides, they're definitely due to me and not due to Adrian. Um, okay. Uh, so why do we um, why do we care about free fermion models? I'll give a lot of different um, reasons that are hopefully appealing to the quantum information audience that I'm talking to today. So one of them is exact solutions for families of spin models. So uh, mapping to free fermions is a sort of workhorse method for finding exact solutions for spin models, and we know that it's generally intractable to find things like ground state energies or other properties of spin models. I mean, believing if you believe standard uh, complexity conjectures. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the reasons that appeals to me and probably some of the people in the audience is that these types of solutions are mathematically elegant. Um, but more practically speaking, they're also a starting point for doing things like perturbation theory. So if you start with something like, you know, an XY chain or something like this, maybe you can perturb around a free theory to try to understand some properties of a system that does have interactions. Uh, but probably more appealing to the computer science side, the, the CS part of the QUIX acronym, is there's a rich connection to complexity theory. Uh, so one of them is uh, via what are called match gate circuits. So this is uh, a class of quantum circuits where we can simulate certain properties of these circuits uh, efficiently but they generate entanglement in an interesting way. So these circuits have been explored. Uh, this is just a subset of the interesting papers on this topic. Um, this is an important class of circuits because similar to stabilizer circuits, or sorry, Clifford circuits, um, we have efficient ways to simulate, um, to simulate these circuits. So you know, whenever we have such things, and, and they're non-trivial circuits as well. So whenever we have such things, that's definitely uh, an important class that we want to understand better. Um, this is also, uh, these ideas of free fermions have also popped up uh, on more classical topics. So there's something called the FKT algorithm for Fisher, Casteller, Casteline, and Temperley. This is an algorithm for counting the number of perfect matchings in a planar graph. Uh, so it turns out that counting the number of uh, perfect matchings in a non-planar graph is a hard problem. I forget exactly what class, again, assuming uh, standard complexity theoretic conjectures. Um, might even be sharp P, but don't quote me on that. Um, so uh, this is an interesting, uh, so these planar graphs using this FKT algorithm, um, there's actually a mapping of this problem into free fermions, and you find what's called a Pfaffian orientation of a spanning tree for this planar graph. Uh, and then you compute a determinant of an associated signed adjacency matrix. It's very beautiful work, uh, and it lets you solve this problem of counting perfect matchings in polynomial time. Um, and recently, very surprising to me, there's a, um, there's a connection to the sensitivity conjecture, which was recently solved by Huang. Um, and Huang doesn't mention the connection to free fermions, but this is explored, I should have added this citation, in a paper by, um, Xiaoyang Qi and colleagues at Stanford. Um, so, you know, the, um, he maps this problem uh, on the Boolean cube uh, to one about a Pali algebra, and uh, the mapping that he uses is exactly related to the Jordan-Figner transformation that we're going to talk about uh, that is 
um, exactly the class of models that we're going to study today related to free fermions. Um, and in all of these applications, actually, graph theory plays a central role. And it's going to play a central role in what we do and what we talk about today as well. So what is a graph? Everybody, I think, in my audience knows what a graph is. It's just a set of vertices v together with a set of edges, which is a subset of v cross v. And what we're going to do is we're going to consider Hamiltonians and the graphs associated to those Hamiltonians defined, defined as follows. So I'm going to work over the next few slides with a concrete example to help illustrate some things. And the example that I'm going to use is popularly known as the xy chain. Actually, I'm lying slightly because the xy chain actually has uh, x, it has a chain of qubits in one dimension with xx between every nearest neighbor and yy between every nearest neighbor. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to stagger and I'm only going to keep half of those terms. And the reason that I'm going to do that is because um, the graphs that I'm going to define, I turn out to get two connected components for this, for the complete xy chain. And I'm going to try to restrict myself to just connected components of graphs because it turns out that when you have two disconnected graphs, I can solve the Hamiltonians that generate those disconnected graphs separately. So solving each connected component can be done. Like I can focus on one connected component without loss of generality. So this is like a sub Hamiltonian of the standard, if you're familiar with it, XY chain model. Uh, and then I'm going to add this extra on-site magnetic field term to all the qubits. So um, I'm just going to illustrate for the special case n equals 4. So the qubits are living here on these blue circles. I have an on-site z term, pairs of xx, then yy, then xx, then yy. And to keep things simple, n is 4, and I've got periodic boundary conditions. So what is the graph that I'm going to associate with this? I'm going to associate to it what I call the frustration graph of the Hamiltonian. So the, for the frustration graph, every vertex, so every Pauli term in this Hamiltonian, if it has a non-zero coupling constant, so here I've set all the coupling constants to be plus one, but I could have more general coupling constants, but I'm going to throw away the coupling constants and consider just only the ones that have a non-zero coupling constant in the Pauli basis. For every Pauli term, I'm going to associate a vertex. And then I draw an edge between two vertices if and only if the associated Pauli operators anti-commute. OK, so that's the frustration graph. So let's just check that I've done that correctly for this graph. So z1, that's this term, anti-commutes with this xx and this yy, but it commutes with all these other terms. And indeed, it only touches x1, x2, and y1, y4. And you can check all the other terms. And indeed, this is the frustration graph uh, for this Hamiltonian. OK, is everybody clear on frustration graph? OK, pretty simple. So now, what I want to do is I want to play a little game. And I'm going to generate a discrete dynamical system uh, starting from this graph. Um, and the game that I'm going to play is the following. I'm going to iterate the following steps. I'm going to add a vertex whose neighbors are vertices neighboring exactly one of either v1 and v2. Right, so I'm going to pick an edge, and then I'm going to apply this step. Exactly one of either v1 and v2, just like this. But I'm not going to add a, uh, so uh, sorry, before I get to that step. So here, I'm looking to only add qubits in the symmetric difference. So this guy is sitting in both. Sorry, I'm adding vertices in the symmetric difference. So this term here is in both, so I don't add an edge. But this guy is only in red, so I add an edge. This guy is only in green, so I add an edge. But I'm not going to add a vertex if there's already a vertex with the same neighbors. So I'm not going to iterate and just keep adding. I'm, I'm not going to add another copy if I draw this edge again. Um, that's, that's not allowed. OK. And then I'm just going to repeat. And I'm going to hope to reach a stable fixed point. OK? That's the goal of this little game. So uh, this first model. I claim, I assert that this is an integrable model or a solvable model. And so let's see what happens when I compare it to one which I claim is not integrable or not solvable. And I'm going to add a single extra term, z1, z2, to this Hamiltonian. And I'm going to see what happens when I iterate this discrete dynamical system. 
So hopefully that's not too choppy. Hopefully you can see what's happening. So after a small number of steps, 27, this discrete dynamical system reaches a fixed point and I can't add any more edges. And this graph has a lot of structure, it looks like. So now when I run it on the non-solvable model, it's getting really nasty and uh, it's very sort of, uh, it, it, you know, it's not clear that it's gonna stop at that point. It actually does stop at that point. Um, and the, the growth of this graph as a function of n is actually exponential in n. The growth over here is not exponential in n. That's gonna be the main difference, okay? And so what I'm actually doing in this discrete dynamical system is I'm actually generating an algebra from these terms and I'm seeing what the closure of that algebra is. And that's why this one is not solvable and why this one is solvable. But the key message is that somehow the graph itself knows the difference. That's what we're gonna show on the next few slides. Okay, so I mean, if I explain this in terms of the algebra, it's sort of obvious, like, yes, it's not integrable. So, you know, this Hamiltonian, the algebra of the coupling constant terms is generating a complete algebra on the qubit space of, you know, two to the n by two to the n matrices. Um, and this one somehow has some restrictions. The point that I'm trying to highlight with this toy discrete dynamical system is just that, can we extract that information purely from the topology of this graph? using graph theoretic ideas, not algebraic ideas. Okay, so let's look again at this solvable case and let's review the solution to a solvable Hamiltonian, uh, solvable by free fermions using the jordan wigner transformation. So what we do is for, uh, we, we start out by defining Majorana fermion mode. So um, uh, if you're a fermion aficionado, you will know there's a difference between Dirac fermions and Majorana fermions. In this talk, I'm only considering Majorana fermions. If you're not a fermion aficionado, um, then uh, you only need to know that these are just operators that share, that have some kind of anti-commutation relation given by this relation here. Okay, this is the canonical anti-commutation relations for these fermion operators, and they're real. Okay, these are real valued. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, define a mapping from these Pauli spins to these fermion operators. Okay, so um, on the jth site, I have a string of sigma z ending in a sigma x on site j, or a string of sigma z ending in sigma y on site j. And I'm going to associate gamma 2j minus one or gamma 2j to those two operators. Okay, so this is gonna give me a collection of 2n for n qubits, now you're on a fermion operators. The Hamiltonian terms here are quadratic in these Majorana operators. That's not an obvious statement, but it becomes clearer why this is true if I just go through an example. So let's look at gamma 10 and gamma 11. If I look at how they map back to these strings of tensor product of Pauli operators, Gamma 10 is four Zs followed by a Y. Gamma 11 is five Zs followed by an X. And if I multiply these two Pauli operators then up to an overall sign, I'm gonna get a two local Pauli operator, right? And so that means that this product of these two Majorana fermions actually gives me a local spin operator, spatially local adjacent uh, in this spin chain, okay? So, um, so in fact, um, what we can do after we now apply this transformation, I'll, I'll spare you the algebra, um, we actually get the following uh, spin chain, okay? So this is just applying this jordan Victor transformation to our, I claim, solvable model. Um, and now what we're going to do is we're gonna map this to a new matrix. Uh, I see somebody maybe posted a question. Hold on. Is a model that is solvable with beta ansatz considered solvable in this approach or is it classified as unsolvable? Um, I mean, it is solvable, but uh, I'm not considering beta ansatz solvable solutions. So if I say solvable or integral, integrable, I really mean solvable by some notion of a jordan wigner transformation, which I'm going to make precise a little bit later. So that was a good question. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna to try to map this 
solution. Uh, sorry, I'm going to try to map this Hamiltonian on the left to some thing on the right. What is the thing on the right? Uh, I'm going to try to map it to a vector, an operator-valued vector of length 2n. So the elements of this vector are these individual Majorana operators. It's a vector of length 2n, and it's operator-valued. And it's going to look like you know, gamma dot h dot gamma. Maybe I need a transpose here. Um, where h, in order to preserve the hermeticity of this operator on the left, I need an i here. And then this becomes an anti-symmetric 2n by 2n matrix. OK? So if there are linear terms in the fermions, I can always complete the square up to some overall energy shift as well. Um, so now it turns out that if you can do this, the Majorana operators, so we, we can do this, and the Majorana operators transform covariantly in the following sense, that if I look in the full 2 to the n dimensional Hilbert space where the qubits act, and I rotate by e to the i h on these Majorana fermion operators, gamma mu, then this smaller 2n by 2n matrix transforms the vector of Majorana fermions, right? So instead of writing this, I could have used vector notation and said e to the minus 4h acts on boldface gamma, OK? So there's a nice covariant transformation property. So now this matrix, if you remember, if this is an anti-symmetric matrix over here, and you remember uh, your studies of Lie groups and Lie algebras, that means that the Lie algebra of anti-symmetric matrices generates the Lie group of special orthogonal 2n dimensional matrices. So this thing is actually a special orthogonal matrix. So now what we can do is we can find the spectrum of this operator as an operator on the full 2 to the n dimensional Hilbert space by diagonalizing this small 2n by 2n matrix. The trick, though, is that we have to diagonalize it not over the unitary group, but over SO2. So that makes things slightly complicated. What you can wind up doing, actually, is diagonalizing, with, diagonalizing it with respect to unitary matrices and then partitioning the spectrum, it turns out, into plus and minus uh, pieces of the spectrum. So, um, so if this is an SO2n matrix, I can always write it. This is the analog of diagonalizing with respect to this family of matrices. The spectrum is going to split in this way into a plus spectrum and a minus spectrum and a direct sum over all of the eigenvalues of this matrix H. And there's n summons, so there's two n total eigenvalues here. This is sometimes called Williamson or Wilkinson, Williamson diagonalization, maybe. Um, but that's the main idea. Right, and now if I use this uh, identity here, this diagonalization, and I plug it into this covariance transformation over here, then I can actually diagonalize the full Hamiltonian in this space um, by, by inserting this mapping. So I can basically take gamma and take the expected value on each side with respect to gamma, and I can insert some operators in here, and when you follow the math, you find that this operator actually diagon that should say h int, this actually diagonalizes the full Hamiltonian in the full space. Right? I just have to apply, uh, I'm not going to show all the math, but I just have to make judicious use of this covariant transformation property. And what happens is after the diagonalization, um, I've mapped this Hamiltonian to a Hamiltonian which looks like a sum of Pauli sigma z operators with individual coupling constants on each of the separate Pauli sigma z operators. So it's really easy to write down all of the eigenvalues of such a Hamiltonian because it's completely decoupled. It's just whether or not each individual spin is pointing up or down, and then I sum up either plus lambda or minus lambda for each of those spins. Okay, so these are the energies, and that allows me to solve all of the um, energies for the full Hamiltonian. And you can get the eigenstates as well. OK, so that's just a review of how we solve general free fermion systems using this jordan wigner transformation. So there are other notions of solvable that I want to include. This is why I was saying I answered that very good question, what does it mean to be solvable? Um, there are other notions of solvable by mapping to free fermions that aren't immediately 
that don't look exactly like the canonical Jordan Bigner transformation. So Kataev uh, has a model uh, that he solved uh, where he considers a honeycomb lattice with XX terms on the blue links, YY terms on the red links, and ZZ terms on the green links, or the vertical links if you're red-green colorblind. Um, and the way that he solves this is he first notices that there are a family of symmetries to this model. So if I take, if I take each of these bonds, uh, XX, YY, ZZ, and I multiply all the bonds around a plaquette, then I'm going to get an XX here and a YY here. That multiplies together on this site to give me a Z. It will multiply on this site to give me an X and so on. And if you carefully track that, I get Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y around this plaquette. But this edge was an XX edge. So in fact, uh, this plaquette term that I've gotten by multiplying all the bonds commutes pointwise with all the terms in this Hamiltonian uh, by this symmetry. Okay, and it's true for all the other bonds. You can check, uh, but it's true by symmetry. So this is a constant, it's a local operator that commutes pointwise with every term in this Hamiltonian. That means that I can assign either plus one or minus one to the eigenvalue of this local Pali operator that describes this plaquette. Um, and on, a, on an n by n lattice or an lx by ly lattice, there are about lx, ly over two such plaquettes. Um, and so there's going to be a large number of, of these constants of the motion. Once I fix those eigenvalues, though, I've got a well-defined um, symmetry sector that I've reduced the uh, problem to within that sector. And there's also like logical type operators, like this string operator that wraps around the torus. I don't want to get bogged down in thinking about those, but you can handle them similarly. So now I've identified some constants of the motion. And I've said, I'm going to assign a plus one or a minus one to that eigenvalue. Did somebody have a question? No? OK. Uh, and now that I've done that, Kataya does find a mapping to free fermions to find the complete solution. And the way that he does this uh, is as follows. For every qubit that sits on each vertex, he maps it to four fermions. So he maps it, so he has two fermion operators, one called C and one called B associated to each one of these. And so at each vertex, he has, uh, or sorry, he has a BX, a BY, a BZ, and a C. So he splits these four fermions in the following way. He has an X, uh, sorry, uh, an X, a Y, and a Z fermion, and then there's the C fermion that sits in the center and kind of decouples. Um, and then what he does is he identifies additional constants of the motion. These turn out to be associated to um, uh, uh, fermion. Uh, so this thing here associates to fermion parity, it turns out. These bonds, I'm not, this is not super important uh, to understand the rest of the talk. So if you don't follow this, this is okay. This is more to just give you a flavor of how different, different free fermion solutions are. So don't worry about this. Uh, if you're not following this in detail, it's just to give you some flavor. Um, so it turns out that these bond terms actually separate and similar to the plaquettes, I can assign plus or minus one to them, however I like, and then solve the leftover matter terms with respect to every bond sector, okay? So this looks totally different to the, uh, this looks totally different to the original Jordan Wigner solution that was solved by Lee Schultz and Mattis of this XY chain. Um, so, um, you know, is there any unified picture that actually says when are these free fermion solutions possible? So now we get to the main results. Okay, so now we're going to consider a general Hamiltonian expanded in the Pali basis. That's what I mean by a Pali Hamiltonian. Of course, I can expand any operator in the Pali basis. So this is without loss of generality. When can we define distinct quadratic fermion operators such that the commutation relations are respected? So this is what I mean by a general jordan Wigner transformation, is that I want to take term by term every piece of this Hamiltonian and find a pair of fermionic bilinear operators such that PJPK anti-commutes whenever the associated Majorana fermion algebra 
has the correct overlap conditions. So when this pair of fermion operators intersects this pair of fermion operators at exactly one point, or exactly an odd number of points actually, right? Um, so that's what I'm after. Okay, so that will prove that that's a, uh, a homomorphism condition on the algebra that these pallies are generating. So I can phrase this graph theoretically. When can we label the vertices of the frustration graph uh, by subsets of size at most two, such that the neighboring vertices subsets intersect in exactly one element? Okay, so that's the graph theoretic rephrasing of this question. And the answer to this question turns out to be a well understood class of graphs. They're called line graphs. So what is a line graph? And I'll show an example of this. So if you didn't follow that, it's okay. Uh, it'll make more sense when I show the example. A line graph, uh, the line graph of a root graph. So I start out with a fiducial graph called the root graph R. It's just a general graph. The line graph is a graph that takes the edge set as its new vertex set. Right, so notice the vertices of the line graph are now the edges of the primary graph, the root graph. And the vertices correspond to the edges of the root graph whenever uh, they neighbor, whenever these edges are adjacent to the same vertex. Let's do an example. So let's start out with this as our root graph, okay? So here are some vertices, here are some edges. The new edges, so the new vertices of the line graph are going to be associated to each of these edges. So I'm gonna put a vertex right here where there's an edge. So let's do that. Here's another edge in the primary graph. So that becomes a vertex. This black edge here is incident on this edge, this black edge here. So therefore the two associated vertices, since they're touching the same primary vertex or root vertex, they're going to now share an edge. And I've denoted that edge by this blue dashed line so that you know that this is an edge in the line graph, not in the root graph. So now extracting this blue line graph thing, I get a new graph over here. This is the line graph. Okay, and that graph should look familiar to you because this was, in fact, the frustration graph of the XY chain Hamiltonian that we wrote down a few slides ago. And I see somebody has a question. Uh, if, oh, it's Ikai. <laughs> if anyone has questions, uh, put them in the chat. Okay. So um, this is a special case of our fundamental theorem. So I told Adrian we should call it the fundamental theorem because I'm not modest. Um, uh, <laughs> um, Anyway, the fundamental theorem should be called Chapman's theorem. Uh, there exists a, what I call a generator to generator, free fermion description of a Pauli Hamiltonian. This is, a, this is an approximate statement of this theorem, if and only if its frustration graph is a line graph. So I'm skipping over a very minor detail, uh, which you can check the paper um, uh, for details. Uh, but I, I'm going to uh, elaborate on the, um, I'm glossing over something, which I will return to later, but don't worry about it. And if you want the precise statement of this theorem, it's in the paper. Um, and the key to proving this theorem is an old result by Krauss called the Krauss, this is called the Krauss decomposition, not to be confused with the Krauss decomposition of a quantum channel. It's spelled differently. Um, the Krauss decomposition of a Leiden graph uh, is an edge partition into clicks or complete graphs um, and he characterized line graphs as being um, those such that their edge partition into clicks, so th they can be decomposed such that the edge partition into clicks is such that every vertex belongs to at most two clicks, maybe fewer than two clicks, but at most two clicks. And that edge partition is going to give us exactly this mapping. Um, so here's a, 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 a more precise statement of the theorem. I forgot that I had this precise thing on the next slide because like I said, um, Adrian made these slides originally. Given a Pauli Hamiltonian, there exists an injective mapping and I'll return to what that mapping is uh, in a bit. Um, uh, what, what the consequences of this injective uh, condition means. 
So if, uh, yeah, there's an injective mapping PJ into a pair of fermion bilinears, J1 and J2, so they retain this J label, they remember that they came from PJ, such that they respect the commutation relations of the Pali algebra. If and only if the frustration graph of H is a line graph for some root graph R. So let me give you a sketch of the proof of this. Um, so suppose that the mapping exists. Let's do the uh, let's do this direction. Suppose that the mapping exists, then you just check, right? So you hand me such a mapping, great, I'm basically done. Because it means that J1 and J2 um, for this pally and K1 and K2 for you know this pally, it means by this definition uh, that they, let me just show this example again, that they intersect at exactly one point. So over here, the clicks are these triangles. And it means that I can edge partition this into, for example, uh, this vertex. Uh, I can associate the fermions over here um, uh, exactly to um, these vertices over here, right? Because there's only going to be at most two of them. That's what Krauss's decomposition says. So that means that these fermion operators are coming in pairs and they're going to touch at exactly one vertex. So they're going to absolutely respect the um, uh, anti-commutation relations of the Pali algebra. So that means the definitions coincide. So this way is easy. To go the other way, if the frustration graph is a line graph, then we can always associate uh, a fermion to every click in the cross decomposition. This gives uh, each pally the fermions to its associated click. Okay, so it's maybe a little bit hard to follow, um, but it's actually pretty easy when you work through a couple of examples and start to see the general picture and then apply Cross's decomposition theorem. So that's a sketch of the proof. Let's do another example because I think it helps illustrate this. So this is an example called the claw graph. Um, so we consider first the path graph, P3. So what is the line graph of this? So for every edge, I associate a vertex. So I would put a vertex here and here and here. So there's going to be three vertices. And these two are adjacent, and these two are adjacent. So the, uh, um, the line graph associated to this path graph is actually a one smaller path graph. So no matter, so now what happens is, suppose I add an edge to the interior of this path graph. So no matter, no matter how I do this, I'm going to create a triangle when I, um, when I take the line graph operation, no matter where I put this, if it's on an interior of such a path. Why? Because this and this are adjacent, so I'm gonna create this. This and this are adjacent, so I'm gonna put an edge here in the line graph. And this and this are still adjacent. So whenever I do this, I'm going to create a triangle. There's no way around that. Adding other edges to elongate this only stretches out this thing. But this, this guy here is always going to be a substructure of any internal graph when I have such a, uh, such a branching structure like this. Right? That's clear. So it is impossible for a line graph to contain a claw. Right? It's just impossible. I cannot have it. So here's a claw. Um, and in fact, this was our nemesis that had this obstruction in it when we looked at the non-solvable model. So we should be able to find, so here's, well, I, I shouldn't say we should be able to find a claw. It turns out here's a claw hiding right here inside this graph, okay? This is a subgraph of this, um, uh, non-solvable models frustration graph. So it turns out there's a really elegant forbidden induced subgraph characterization of um, line graphs. This is due to Beinecke from 1970. And Beinecke showed that there are uh, exactly nine forbidden subgraphs. So some of these vertices are colored red. Ignore that for now. Uh, we'll we'll uh, get to that later in the talk. But these nine subgraphs on at most six vertices are induced subgraphs of a graph if and only if um, the graph is not a line graph. So these are the forbidden, this is a forbidden subgraph characterization. So this is a really beautiful theorem by Bayeka. 
that means that these are frustration structures that are exactly the obstructions to finding a free fermion solution. Okay, so I think this is a really nice result. There are a few other really nice results now that we've connected this problem of solvable models to graph theory. There's such a rich literature in graph theory. So uh, Whitney proved in 1932 what's called the Whitney isomorphism theorem. It says that except for uh, the triangle graph, K3, the root graph, if I, if I, go, if I try to invert this uh, line graph operation, uh, then except for one example, it has a unique pre-image. And the one example is this K3, so it's a little triangle graph. And K3 actually has two pre-images, one of which is the claw, one of which is again K3. Um, and I'm going to use these in a minute, these two isomorphism theorems. The other one is due to Jung from 1966 that says if two connected graphs are edge isomorphic with more than four vertices, then they are also vertex isomorphic, and this vertex isomorphism is unique. Okay, so again, if you didn't follow that, it's okay. Um, the point is that we can actually use these isomorphism theorems. They do all the heavy lifting for us, um, and then we can look at the physical interpretation of these results on a free fermion solvable models side. So what are some implications of these isomorphism theorems? The first is that um, if I take a single qubit algebra, then there are actually two ways to fermionize a single qubit. So if you're, if you're, if you're Kataev and you're in the business of solving models exactly because you're brilliant, this is what you do, uh, you might think that there are maybe lots of different creative ways that you might try to take pairs of qubits and free fermionize them and sort of search for these different fermionizations to try to find models that are free fermion solvable. And uh, our, a consequence of this is that there's no way to do this uh, when you're restricting to these generator to generator mappings um, once you go beyond a single qubit. There's only two ways to do it, and they're characterized exactly by the two unique pre-images uh, for this special case. And that's because this is the frustration graph for this Hamiltonian. And there are two, these are the two different fermionizations one of them is this claw graph, uh, and one of them is this um, triangle graph again. Um, and this is the one that Kataev uses, uh, and we actually gain some insight into this because this uh, gauge symmetry in Kataev's solution winds up being related to the fermion parity operator, um, which is why he has these extra degrees of freedom that he has to account for before he can completely solve the model. It's an artifact of the fact that um, in this particular free fermionization, the fourth mode, gamma 3, doesn't actually contribute to the Pali algebra. Another implication, um, which is immediate from the fact that line graphs have a forbidden subgraph characterization, is that line graphs can be recognized efficiently. So if you write down a Hamiltonian in terms of its Pali operators, you can say immediately whether or not a solution method like this can be applied to that model. So uh, just from the forbidden subgraph characterization, there's an, I, a naive n to the sixth power algorithm. You enumerate all subgraphs on at most uh, six nodes, and you just check, are any of these equal to um, one of these nine? Uh, you just do a graph isomorphism test uh, to see if any of them uh, equals one of these nine graphs. Um, and if not, then you're good, it's a line graph. Uh, and if it is, then it's definitely not a line graph. Uh, there are much faster algorithms that run in linear time by De Georgie and Simon, or Rostopoulos, or Leo. Uh, so we can actually, very, there's very fast algorithms for finding, for testing whether or not you're a line graph. Uh, and the last impl implication that I want to talk about is uh, Clifford symmetries. So a Clifford symmetry, by a Clifford symmetry, uh, so, so informally, you can say that Clifford symmetries are necessarily symmetries of the fermions. But actually, because of this result of Jung, um, we can only say that when the uh, Hamiltonian has more than four vertices. Uh, there are some exceptional cases for very small Hamiltonians. Um, so except for the four uh, root graphs over here on the left half 
the left column over here. Any uh, Clifford symmetry is also a symmetry of the free fermion model. And what I mean by that is, um, suppose I have a Clifford operator which preserves the Hamiltonian. So u dagger u conjugating h maps you back to h. Then there is also a signed permutation symmetry that preserves the, uh, the 2n by 2n uh, single particle matrix little h. Okay? And that's true whenever I don't have one of these exceptional cases. And by Jung's theorem, these are the only exceptional cases. Okay, uh, there's another family of symmetries that we can understand, but we have to do a little bit more work. Uh, and that's what I call graphical symmetries. Um, these are, you could also call them the Pauli symmetries of the Pauli Hamiltonian. So I'm gonna look at which subsets of these Pauli operators and products of this algebra are actually symmetries of this Hamiltonian. So in order to do that, we can look for products that commute term by term. Going back to this Kataev solution, this is like the Plaquette terms that we looked at, okay? So these are either stabilizers or logical qubits, if you're more of uh, thinking about these things in terms of quantum error correcting codes or something like that. Uh, but it's a little more general than that. So these are products of Pallys that commute term by term with every uh, term inside this pattern. These are subsets. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to treat these as graphical structures, and they arise as one of three graphical structures. Twin vertices, which I'll describe what those are in a second. Cycles in the root graph, and we see that over here. Or uh, the fermion parity operator, which also has a graphical interpretation, but I don't want to get into that because it involves introducing something called a T-join that I don't want to talk about. So we can solve this free fermion model. Once I've identified a symmetry, just like Kataya did, I can fix an eigenvalue of one of these because it commutes with the whole Hamiltonian and then solve the free fermion model uh, within that eigenspace. And every eigenspace retains the free fermion solvable property. So what are twin vertices? A, a twin vertex is a pair of vertices that has the same neighborhood. Now, if I find twins, if I find a pair of twins, I can remove those twins by fixing the corresponding stabilizer value. So how do I do it? So here's a graph, and if I look at this vertex, x1, x2, and I look at this vertex, x3, x4, their neighborhoods are the same. They both share y1, y4, and y2, y3. Um, and so therefore, y1, y4, and y2, y3 are actually twins by the definition of a twin. What that means is the product of the associated Pauli operators is a good quantum number. It commutes with everything. It, it commutes with all of these terms. And so therefore, y1, y2, y3, y4, I can just fix an eigenvalue of that. Commutes with the whole Hamiltonian. This is now a reduced Hamiltonian from our original example. And once I've fixed that, I can delete one of these at will because I know that this other guy is just going to have, uh, I've, I've fixed this symmetry sector. Um, so now I've reduced the model. I've deleted this edge and I'm down to this, uh, whoops, this reduced graph over here. And I can repeat this. I can repeat this to all the twin vertices in the graph until I'm left with a twin free graph. And if this twin free graph is a line graph, then it's free from the unsolvable. So I've eliminated all the twins. So here again, um, this guy, uh, these guys have the same neighborhood, so they're twins. Therefore, I can assign their product to be plus or minus one, and I've reduced it even further. And this reduced matrix now is a smaller graph, uh, and it is free from the unsolvable. So this can always be done for products of pairs, and I can, um, it doesn't matter which order I do it to reduce these graphs. Um, and maybe in the interest of time, I might skip through this and say that um, there's a nice factorization theorem that lets us characterize uh, all the cycles and the fermion parity uh, by taking advantage of the fact that the adjacency matrix thought of as a mod two uh, matrix of this um, line graph actually factorizes in a nice way in terms of the incidence matrix. And so mod two, what this is saying is that this vertex operator, I'm sorry, this vector here, which can be thought of as the support of whether or not a Pauli operator in the line graph is present, um, uh, this, is like a, this is like a cycle in the graph to say that A dot V 
vanishes mod two. Uh, so these are exactly the cycles, um, and this is exactly the fermion parity condition. I'm gonna, I, I went through that quick because I, uh, in the interest of time, I wanna get to some other things that are uh, maybe a little less technical. So there's one thing that, that might be bothering you about this, which is how do I know that I've chosen consistent signs for all of the operators uh, in this homomorphism? How do I know that I didn't screw up somewhere uh, where I associated, you know, plus I to this pally, but, you know, maybe later on, I made an inconsistent sign choice by putting also gamma J1, but with a minus sign, and maybe um, I wind up getting some situation where, um, you know, uh, something is supposed to square to the identity, but uh, it doesn't, it's, it's inconsistent, an inconsistent sign choice. So you are right to worry about that, but there's a solution, and the solution is the following. You can always choose a spanning tree of a root graph. So you look at the root graph, you associate um, a spanning tree to this root graph. I orient the edges on this tree arbitrarily. This corresponds to different freedom in, th this is like the maximal amount of freedom that I have. And I can choose those edges and their signs arbitrarily. But once I fixed those, it constrains all the other edges. So these cannot change the spectrum of the local single particle operator. It turns out to just be equivalent to saying, well, this qubit, you know, I can, I can um, either choose this to be up and this to be down or vice versa. I'm gonna get the same spectrum regardless of whether I choose this to be zero or this to be zero and the other one one or vice versa. Um, it just changes the eigenvectors by a diagonal plus or minus one matrix, okay? But now uh, these graphs are not generally trees. So every time I add an edge, it's going to create a cycle because I took a spanning tree. So adding one more edge inserts a cycle. That cycle is now constrained to obey a self-consistent uh, constraint. Okay, so the tree gives me the maximal amount of freedom. The remaining edges tell me, uh, together with the cycle constraint, tell me how I have to choose the signs on all the remaining edges. And you can just always do this because you can always choose a span the tree. Okay, so that's how you can fix cycles. So putting this all together, here's how you can solve an arbitrary solvable model. You first um, check if the frustration graph is a line graph by possibly removing twins if necessary. And it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how you do this, you just uh, pick a symmetry sector, all the symmetry sectors have the same property. If it's a line graph, which we can test in polynomial time, actually linear time, then we find all the graphical symmetries as well. And then for each symmetry eigenvalue configuration, we choose an orientation by finding a spanning tree. And then for every edge that we add to that spanning tree, we choose the orientation on that to be self-consistent with the eigenvalues for the cycle, or with the, the parity of the cycle. Then we can solve the fermion, free fermion Hamiltonian by mapping to the resulting single particle matrix using the, the, the standard method that we use, um, restricted to fixed parity eigenspace if necessary. So that's how it works. So I wanna do a couple of examples. So this is a, the most general nearest neighbor one-dimensional free fermion solvable Hamiltonian. So uh, up top is the frustration graph, and I've colored the edges to be um, black, green, red, or blue. Um, these edges are gonna get mapped to vertices in the line graph. This is the line graph actually uh, for this root graph. So the gray, red, green, and blue vertices over here are actually coming from uh, black, red, green, or blue edges in the frustration graph. The red line that forms like the backbone of this is the spanning tree. I see that there's a question. Uh, I'll get to it in a second. Um, the, the red is the spanning tree. So now I can choose uh, the signs of those arbitrarily when I'm making these generators, but for things to be self-consistent, the black ones actually have a constrained value for their sign. 
So the mapping between, you know, there is going to be a fermion bilinear from here to here, and the sign on that term is going to be constrained by um, self-consistency of that cycle. Okay. Uh, so Ikai's question is, is there a physically meaningful interpretation of what the algorithm is doing when it checks the frustration graph is a line graph? Yeah, it is checking for obstacles to having a free fermion description. That's exactly what it's doing. Um, because um, uh, we can only have fermion bilinear terms if and only if none of these obstructions exist. So it's like, it's like checking that there's a self-consistent assignment to fermion bilinear terms. Otherwise, you will need an interacting term uh, to do this. So you can also identify where you must have an interaction as well. Like you could sort of, and I'll return to this point at the conclusion slide, you can try to sort of find like the, the best uh, free fermion description of a given Hamiltonian. And uh, there's some notion that I want to define of like a free fermion rank, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. I know that I'm running low on time, so I'll be quick. Um, you know, Kataev's solution, now we can also understand in this framework. It fits also in this general framework. So over here on the left, um, we have these small white vertices are the Pali terms in the Hamiltonian. And um, they form a Kagome lattice for their frustration graph. The line graph of that is actually the Hamiltonian, uh, is actually the honeycomb graph. Uh, so it's a bit of a coincidence that it's, you know, when you actually write down the model, the honeycomb model that Kataya wrote down, um, the line graph is that honeycomb graph. Um, so that's a nice coincidence here, but that's not true in general, as you saw in the previous slide. So now uh, I've got this honeycomb model over here, and I can, again, I can find a spanning tree, that's the red edges. I can sign those terms however I wish when I write down the fermion operators, but now the signs of the remaining edges are constrained by self-consistency with these plaquette operators. The conserved bond operators that we talked about track the edge orientation outside the spanning tree, um, and, and that's what lets me solve this. Um, in the interest of time, there's a really interesting model related to the gauge color code um, that uh, I've written down the Hamiltonian here. It splits into a bunch of different chains that are sort of coaxial, each of which is solvable by free fermions. I'm not going to say more about that. Um, this is a brand new model that we call the Sierpinski Hanoi model that can be solved by this. Um, it encodes some, um, if you think of this as a quantum code, actually it encodes logical qubits at some constant asymptotic rate of 11 18ths. Uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, and the Hamiltonian, where I have these terms, x, y, z, around the triangles that are sitting inside this Sierpinski triangle. Um, uh, actually, this is the line graph over here. Um, uh, you know, it actually is solvable by free fermions. And it's still solvable even if we add local terms. So we can add local field terms that couple um, or that live on the edges that live between these triangles that are oriented in a certain way. I don't, uh, I'm running a little low on time, so I don't want to get into that mapping. We've actually done the calculation and found the band structure for these. Uh, and there's an interesting critical point here um, as I tune through the coupling in this model. Um, so um, yeah, we conjecture that there's an interesting um, crossing here related to the scale symmetry in the infinite length. Okay, the last thing that I want to talk about before I get to my conclusions, and I'll be very quick. There was an interesting paper by Paul Fenley that he wrote last year called Free Fermions in Disguise. And in it, he showed that the following model has a free fermion solution. So I sum over terms with coupling constants that are z, z, x. So next nearest neighbor, or three body terms, just like this. And if I write down the frustration graph, it looks like this. Uh, however, you can check, you scroll back through my slides and you see this is one of the forbidden induced subgraphs. So, okay, here I'm telling you that there's a free fermion solution. Here I'm explicitly showing you the frustration graph and I'm telling you that this is one of the Binecka 9 forbidden subgraphs. What gives? 
uh, did I lie to you? Is there something wrong with my theorem? No. So the key thing in my theorem is that my definition of solvable was generator to generator mappings. Fenley's solution is crazy. It's really ingenious. And it shows that there's a construction of a, of a set of commuting conserved charges by taking products of these terms along certain chains um, that have certain restrictions. And then he defines this transfer matrix, polynomial value transfer matrix. Um, it's really ingenious. And then what he does is he adds a fake fermionic mode to the boundary, uh, which is kind of like adding a vacuum state or a highest weight state, if you're familiar with these notions. And then he acts on it by this transfer operator. Uh, and by doing this, he can generate all of the states uh, in the Hilbert space and extract their energies. It's really crazy how he does this. So um, we think we actually understand why this works in a graph theoretic way. Um, and we conjecture that Fenley's model actually generalizes to a really large, or Fenley's solution method actually generalizes to a really large class of graphs, which is any frustration graph, which is claw-free and even hole-free. And even hole uh, is a hole, it's a cycle that has no chords. So it's, a, it's like a fundamental cycle um, of even length. So four or more um, uh, nodes, and there's no chord that intersects in the middle of the cycle. Um, so this is potentially, we're, we're sort of close to proving this. We have one last little loose end that we have to tie up. This is joint work with Adrian Chapman and Sam Elman. Uh, this is potentially a new family of coupling independent free fermion solutions that we can study. Okay, so this is my last slide. Um, so we've given a graph theoretic characterization of a wide class of free fermion solvable models. We've also classified all the symmetries of these models and we've given a complete prescription for uh, how to actually solve them, um, you know, actually using this graph theory. Um, and cases where the solvability depends on fine tuning of the coupling coefficients or on using this like Fendley style transfer matrix method are outside the scope of this solution family. Um, things like beta onsatz, as somebody remarked, are outside of the scope of this uh, solution method. But this is like the most natural thing you would consider initially uh, is these generator to generator mappings, and we've completely solved that problem. Um, so some applications are doing things like using this for uh, perturbation theory, like with quantum impurity models. Um, I mentioned briefly this idea of a free fermion rank. So I would love to understand if you can decompose Hamiltonians into um, a sum of free fermion solvable models uh, and define a notion of rank. So the minimal number of free fermion models that you need to describe a more general Hamiltonian, can this be used to do things like speed up quantum chemistry or uh, simulations on quantum computers or something like that? Because the free fermion rank is going to probably be smaller. We actually have examples where it's provably smaller, but uh, we don't have any asymptotic statements. Uh, it's provable by some small number, like a small constant fraction or a small constant, uh, a small additive, you know, it's like three less. Uh, so it's not super interesting at the moment. But, you know, can we find classes of Hamiltonians where um, we can actually speed up simulation of quantum chemistry by appealing to the fact that we can split them into a smaller number of terms um, because they're not just um, uh, commuting Pauli operators, but they're more general, they're free from the solvable models. Um, and we're also looking at, um, besides this uh, Fendley uh, solution method, I've also been uh, working with Alicia Kolar at University of Maryland to study some properties of translation invariant free fermion models and whether or not we can understand things um, like when are these models, models solvable? Can we understand um, the block spectrum by studying just the unit cell only uh, and study you know, infinite uh, properties of these models, like formally infinite properties of a formally translation invariant model by studying like the block wave spectrum. Um, and we have some interesting partial results there. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Steve. And yeah, yeah, let's thank our, our speaker. Um,